All right, welcome, November fourth, peoples. Um, we're uh, let's start with some agenda planning for the subsequent meetings. Um, next week is Veterans Day. Uh, is Veterans Day a day that we meet? Is a question I have for the group. Um, how how seriously are people taking Veterans Day as a as a day to go out and do Veterans Day things? We meet on Wednesday. Isn't Veterans Day always on Monday? Uh, I looked at the calendar. So, no, according to the calendar, Veterans Day is Wednesday. Huh. Weird. Um, uh, uh, in any case, I will I will be away on vacation uh, and unavailable anyway. So it's up to you guys. Um, I think I'm just going to, uh, unless somebody has a topic that's urgent, uh, let's let's just skip next week and unfortunately also the subsequent week on account of uh, TC39. Mm -hmm. um, oh, another scheduling thing is uh, essentially midnight tomorrow night is the deadline for putting things on the agenda for advancement. Midnight tomorrow night uh, Pacific time, that is. Uh, according to November 16, we're, yeah, there's a, there's a list of announcements at the top of the agenda, and I do not know who contributed them, but according to this, oh, Denji, ah, yes, the 6th, right, the next meeting on the 16th, agenda, yes, thank you. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a bit of a break, um, and then yeah. it'll. <clears throat> Chris, would we also. Um, will we plan a meeting the day before Thanksgiving? <laughs> that is that is the next question. Shall we meet the day before Thanksgiving? Um, uh, I am. I can be. I can be available. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, can I, I can. I can meet and bake at the same time. I think. Um, the, okay. Yeah, uh, the day before Thanksgiving is fine with me. All right. Um, I'm not okay. So the eve of Thanksgiving, I have proposed um, that we talk about the topic that Dan Ehrenberg suggested for uh, module blocks, um, which will be fun because module blocks were in the original simple modules proposal. Um, and, uh, and it looks like we do not have, uh, we do not have confirmation from our uh, of, from Surma, um, but we can follow up on that. Dan, if Surma is not available, would you like to still pursue this topic um, in two weeks? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to pursue it without him. Okay. And I can just give him the, the update afterwards. All right, and um, there's still plenty of time to, to uh, plenty of time to rope him in if he is available. Um, okay, cool. Uh, and so can I can I present or? Uh, yes, let's let's plan for you to present T tentatively, unless we can get uh, unless we can get Surma to present. Oh, sorry, we're not talking about today. We're talking about a future meeting. Future meeting, yeah. Um, this would be uh, which? November twenty fifth. November twenty. Okay, 20th. I'll get in touch with Surma and, and ask him about that. Okay, cool. Um, let's uh, so tentatively planning for. Uh, November 25th to talk about module blocks. Um, and we do have confirmation from, uh, from multiple invited experts that they would be available to talk about hot module replacement on December 2nd. Um, and uh, as evaluator module attributes that can be, can reinterpret modules was also a side topic uh, that I propose that we discuss and for that we would need you Dan um, is that all right sound good December which day of December the second yes okay cool um, 
And then uh, we had a, a, from Salesforce, uh, Charles Vaughn uh, would be available to talk with us about uh, the co uh, uh, coherence between WebAssembly and content security policies. Um, and he's confirmed. So uh, this would uh, carry us through most through most of the, most of the year. Um, uh, does this does this agenda does this set of agendas for the upcoming meeting sound good to everyone here? Or are there any objections or additional topics? Okay, um, so I move that we. Um, Plan, plan accordingly, and uh, I'll, I'll set up the agenda to confirm this, uh, the agendas to confirm the schedule. Um, okay, that, uh, that's, a, that's all I've got for um, proposing agenda topics. Uh, let's, uh, let, uh, we have a realms update from Leo. Um, does 10 minutes sound good, Leo? Um, probably less than that, unless we have questions. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to add this uh, such in a short notice. Um, but uh, first of all, I, I like to share this. I just received my ECMO award. I'm so glad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this thing is heavy. Uh, I just received it from the uh, from the mail. Um, but uh, talking about realms, um, I discussed with Kariti, and uh, we should be tentatively going for uh, stage three at this DC39 meeting and this uh, in November. Uh, there, uh, there are things that are not like as ready as I wanted them to, to be, but I think we have enough of uh, new information and feedback. I'm gonna try to summarize some of them. We identified some uh, prior art for usage of realms like in uh, V8, uh, for Android, those use realms. It's probably the same thing powering, um, there is powering Node.js uh, VM. Um, also, we identified a prior art for also uh, realms creation in Safari. There is a JS context group create. Um, and basically those shows like some prior art uh, being used already for, that is basically similar to what we want for realms. Uh, we've had some uh, um, feedback. I've, ha I, I've had a, a, a somehow neutral feedback from Zilla, but it's more in sort of, uh, if we go with realms, they're positive to, to go with it as well. Uh, they're neutral in the sense, yes, they, they will, uh, be on the same page if we actually go for stage three, but uh, also not, not blocking it at any point. Um, I've got some uh, similar feedback from uh, WebKit in, in the terms of uh, it, it, it works for them. It doesn't have anything outstanding to, for us to uh, get our attention into or that would be a problem. Um, this is the, the, the best sense that we can get from, from web, WebKit in terms of like, we, we cannot tell uh, what is gonna be in their plans. Um, and it's fine. I think those are positive. From the Chrome perspective, we've had some concerns if that uh, would be implementable or not. And uh, during some investigation and a lot of reach out here and there, uh, Caridi, uh, Daniel Ehrenberg, and I, we've got some uh, interesting feedback that we actually found that realms, uh, like the functionality for uh, realms is already there, uh, that what we want for realms is already there in, in V8. Basically, most of those implementations is, uh, re will require, uh, for most of it, like a feature exposure. Uh, that there is already implemented in those engines. Um, so I think this is good enough to try uh, stage three. There is the ongoing uh, tag reveal. It's not complete yet, but so far it's very positive. 
Um, unfortunately, by the timing only, we've had tip back uh, less until last week, and that kind of like uh, became a blocker for our agenda in the tag reveal. But I think tag is being pretty positive. Uh, the last thing that I'm doing, I'm syncing uh, directly with Shu from V8 on Monday, just to make sure. Um, I think Shu is a, a last point that we need to make sure like we are good to request for stage three. Hopefully it will go uh, nice, at least to, to give it a try and to give it a report. I'm just telling <laughs> now because- Are you planning to ask for stage three at, the, at this upcoming meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because I think we like all those, uh, all those facts that I tried to summarize here, I think they're good enough for us to have like an understanding like this is implementable and uh, this is already existing. It's just like ex exposing a, a, a feature that is already available in engines. And uh, I think I am satisfied with the use cases, like the, the list of use cases that we have. We have many, we have plenty of use cases. Um, it's not a common use case for some uh, browser uh, developers, as some of them pointed out, like they don't, they're not gonna use that, but it's, uh, we have plenty of use cases for the web dev uh, reality. And even for uh, other companies like such as Google, like the AMP team would, uh, definitely use realms. They want to use realms. So yeah, I think we we have good uh, a good enough amount of facts. That is really awesome. It would be really. It might be helpful to have somebody from the AMP team, the there to throw in their weight. Actually, um, no, we we do uh, we do. Uh, there is a uh, Justin uh, Ridgewell. He's uh, part of the M team and he's pretty interested uh, with it. So, and he attends the TC39 meetings. Hopefully he will be there. Wonderful. It's just going to be tough because uh, at Pacific time, it's going to be somewhere around like one to 6 a.m. <laughs> oh, that's going to be lovely. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, I just wanted to first uh, tell this group out. I'm definitely going to add this to the agenda today and probably add in a link to the slides tomorrow. Oh, thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you. Thanks. I'm very happy to hear all these updates. All right. Um, I'm going to attempt to finish this presentation. Um, we're resuming from slide 35. Uh, nothing up my sleeve. One of these windows, there it is. All right. Can everybody see proposal consolidate compartment options bag? Yep. yep. All right. Um, so this is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll go through it anyway. At the moment, um, the compartment as specified today um, takes three positional arguments, all of which are optional, one of which is an options bag. Um, and I would like, I think it would be good, uh, even though there are few precedents for constructors in the language that only take an options bag because all of their parameters are optional, um, I, to, uh, to move in the direction of having a single options bag, uh, it, since I think that that is coherent. And um, there's some nice things that come out of this is that it puts module map and module map hook on the same footing. Um, and, uh, and because each use of the compartment constructor tends to emphasize a different subset of its functionality, either the module loader or uh, creation of a global scope for uh, um, uh, a creation of a global scope for uh, for evaluation, um, this this would make the usage less tortuous, um, uh, as as in my experience from writing tests. Um, 
some things writing in here are that because endowments did not previously have a name, um, because it was a positional argument, I would like to just name that globals in order to avoid uh, avoid a point of confusion that, that crops up when talking about CES in, in terms of the compartment API. Um, and that is that endowments is too general of a term. Endowments can refer to powerful modules that are injected through the module map just as well as it can refer to powerful globals. You know, that are injected, and they don't and the and the globals that are injected need not necessarily be powerful. Um, and with that, it gives us an opportunity to name global lexicals locals as their counterpart, um, which I think is sensible. But I am not stuck on the point. Um, Let me just give a quick reaction. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I like moving them all into an options bag, giving them all names. I like I very much like your point that different uses of compartments will emphasize different things. Uh, um, uh, the uh, critical uh, uh, group to get feedback from on this is moddable because they already implemented, A, because they already implemented the other one, and B, when we've suggested this to them before, uh, they were resistant. So they're the only, that's the only resistance that I know of to moving to a completely name-based API for this. Right. The other I quick feedback here is uh, turning endowments into globals I like, uh, turning global lexicals into locals I hate. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, they are, uh... they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're as global as the globals are in the sense that they're in scope for the entire compartment and the name locals doesn't get, get that, implies something different. And there's always the possibility that we'll have to have a name for a global contour that is distinct. Yeah. So what are we looking at as the difference between these two? Uh, between these, the option left and the right? No, between um, what you've currently got as globals versus global lexicals. Global so, lexicals are the, uh, is that scope that uh, does not get reified as an object in scope, unlike globals. So globals are properties of the global object. Pro yes. Globals are properties that will be added to the, the object named compartment.global this. Um, and will be in scope. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd probably, given given that, I don't think I think I like globals as the name for the global lexicals, and what is currently called globals should be something like global object properties or global properties or you know. Well, they are in scope. I mean, in both cases, um, they are. You do have variables in scope. Um, uh, the, the the you know one of them is is the outer one and is aliased to properties on the global this. Uh, and the other one is, uh, and is therefore on an object environment. Uh, the other one is um, uh, inside that scope wise, so it can shadow the other. Uh, and it's in a, a lexical contour, I believe, rather than an object. Uh, I mean, in a lexical environment uh, in terms of spec language rather than a- Right. Uh, so object. Could I uh, suggest, I, I think we're saying the word global is a prefix and then we can contrast what is lexical versus whatever the most appropriate contrast word for that. Oh. Uh, so, so global X versus global Y and the two, the two make sense because one of them is different from the other but they're both functionally the same if yeah. you're writing code. Yeah. I could buy global properties, although uh, members maybe or something like yeah, that. Like, yeah, yeah, we're not passing them as properties. And at the moment, the spec is that they get added to global this via object assign. So um, any accessors would be erased. Um, so if you provide a globals object here and it has accessors, they would be erased by object assign um, right. or called, called once and captured anyway. Um, so I, I don't like properties for that reason. So are they, sorry, are they considered assignments to the global objects? They are. Or in, in the current specific, as specified currently, they are, they are uh, assigned. Um, yeah. That's certainly something we should, we should also discuss. It's not, it's not at all clear that that's the right decision, but that's, after going back and forth a few times, that's, that's, that's where we settled so far. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I, I, Go ahead. Moving away from endowments is definitely um, uh, 
you know, um, likely a move to happen. I, it sounds like a very reasonable move, I guess. Uh, but uh, moving to what exactly? I think yeah, that that seems to. Okay. Yeah, yep. yeah. This, this feedback is excellent. I think that the the main point of this slide is that I that I would love to have an options bag, and I consider uh, I uh, and we just need to get um, we need to have that conversation with Modable present. Um, yeah. The the specific names of these things we can continue, and the semantics of these things we can continue to discuss independently. Um, yeah, I, I strongly support the, the big picture move. Like the the options bag is is so much more comprehensible than the privileging of certain aspects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, so to be ahead. clear, we're not talking about what we've termed a handler, which is persistent lookups. These are all looked up only once during construction initialization. Uh, global lexicals certainly are uh, need to be looked up once because they construct constants in scope um, of modules uh, and evaluation. Uh, the the globals we can continue to debate, but at the moment, uh, at the moment, the sh the says shim um, assigns them to global this inside of the constructor. It's actually kind of an unnecessary API. Um. It's a convenience. Um, because the capability to add properties to global this exists after you construct the compartment anyway. Um, yes, we've we've had this talk before. You, oh, you have my concerns. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the options bag itself, not the globals. Oh, I just want to be sure we're not mixing dynamic uh, lookup after creation for resolve hook, etc. Things that might be called many times. Yeah, the, uh, the, the place where we've got, um, uh, is, the, is the proxy handler the only existing handler we've got in the language right now? No, there was something else I looked up. Uh, it's something obscure though. Uh, I forget what it was. It showed up when we were discussing uh, map normalization. Oh. We have two. Yeah, with, with regard to the proxy handler, I will say, I think it was a mistake that the methods on it are looked up each time. Um, well, I mean, that's a mistake that cost us. Um, uh, for these, I think by simply by calling it an options bag rather than calling it a handler, uh, we can make it unsurprising to have all of these things looked up once. And I think they should be looked up only once. I know uh, the DOM has several things that do the lookup and uh, V8 would prefer we do the lookup every time just so they feel it is more consistent. Uh, okay, that's an argument. When Whenever we, we get an options bag, that's, that's what their feeling was. Okay, I, th I think that's an argument we'll need to have. Um, one of the things is if you look it up once, then you can um, make, then you, well, this applies more to proxies, uh, the missed opportunity than it does to compartments, but I think it's true for both. If you look it up only once, then when you see the absence, you can optimize for the absence. If it always might appear and then you have to treat it like it's there, then you can't opt, then there are certain optimization opportunities you cannot realize. Yeah. Um... And if we end up, if this ends up being a handler object, it'll obviously have to, we'll have to be very clear about when it, when we call methods of, or you know, access properties and call methods of that handler object, because there is no sensible um, lazy binding for name globals or global lexicals. Um, that even the module map, there's no sensible use of it uh, post construction. Um, but I could see them, I could see. I could see the resolve hook, load hook, and module map hook as having method semantics on the handler object. I just think that it's yeah, the, not the, desirable. <laughs> the other thing that, that uh, goes with the expectations around calling it a handler versus calling it an options bag is when the methods are invoked, what is their this binding? 
if I think this is an options bag, I would expect them to be called as functions with this binding of undefined. If I, call, if I expect this thing to be a handler, then I would expect that the, that the this binding is the handler object themself, itself as it is for the, proxy, for the handler methods of the proxy. Well, in any case, thank you, Bradley, for um, raising, the, ra raising the possibility of an objection. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how we could meet such an objection if we if we received it? Is there? A I sense mean, we can simply state that it doesn't make sense, and I think that might be enough. Um, particularly altering or removing of these, I don't think would be safe after you start using them. That's a really good argument. Yeah, I mean, already in the session, um, the compartment, can, uh, the import method, a compartment can be constructed without a resolve hook or a load hook or any of the other module related properties of the options bag, but, um, but import will throw. Um, if, there, if, the, if resolve hook in particular and load hook are omitted, um, since there's no sensible behavior in their absence. Um, this also gets into uh, prototype lookups because I do know you can get weird prototype delegations to pollute things in JS already. Like uh, if you add a value field to object prototype, it destroys object defined property usage. So I think, I think that for this conversation, I'm getting that there's a very coherent way to explain why this is an options bag and not a handler, uh, which is um, uh, this is really about configuring the compartment on instantiation. It is, not a, it is not primarily about the dynamic behavior of the compartment once instantiated. And in that regard, it's completely different than the proxy handler. The proxy handler so, is all about what it does on each trap. So I think one thing we might actually want to do is we do have some invariance about objects. It might make sense to have just the statement that we plan on, even if we never do, uh, having some invariance about realms and having it be dynamic would be difficult to enforce that. Mm. Because I don't think a realm should be able to alter a module map that it has. No. It, are, you, are, you, are you meaning to say realm rather than compartment, Bradley? Uh, yes, I mean compartment, sorry. Okay. Yes, I think, I think that um, at all these levels, the more we can state invariants that, that give us guaranteed stability properties, the better off we are, yes. Yeah, altering the module map. Uh, altering the module map at uh, 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 live is and uh, <laughs> yeah, would introduce complications. Um, yeah, yeah. Notably, it would introduce the expectation that the module map would be modified by the module system itself, so that it could be you know, have produced some observable state about the loader, which we definitely would not want to reveal. Um, Anyhow, uh, okay. So I'm going to I'm I'm going to proceed on the uh, on the assumption that this group at least has um, uh, enjoys the idea of of altering the proposal in this way. There are some logistical problems uh, of moving forward with with compatibility, both for the session and for excess, um, that will keep things the way they are for well until that we until we have a deeper uh, decision discussion about. Um, the next major versions of all of all of these tools um, and how to migrate. All right. Um, this is uh, this is uh, Bradley. I'm glad you're here for this one. I have an open issue. Uh, with, uh, I I made an attempt some time ago when I uh, when uh, I first saw the compartment proposal and started using it. That it seemed to me inconsistent that the import method of the compartment API has a very different behavior than the, the dynamic import inside of the scope of a compartment. Um, 
And uh, in particular, uh, I, I'm very sympathetic that Venable modules have very strange behavior in ECMAScript. Um, that <laughs> that uh, when you use dynamic import on a thenable module, it calls then of the thing in order to resolve a promise, um, uh, in, in order to resolve the promise returned by import. Uh, but since that ship has sailed, uh, I propose that it was be, be less surprising and better overall if we were consistent with the part that can't move, which is the dynamic import as specified already today. Um, the uh, I had a conversation with Bradley about this. Um, I had not expected that part of the rationale for boxing the proxied exports in this promise um, was that there was a possibility of having other, uh, of introducing additional data apart from the module exports namespace on that. Um, so in, in short, I am proposing, and I still feel strongly um, that it would be great if we could uh, alter the specification such that dynamic import returns the proxy to exports wrapped in a promise directly. Um, and I open it to discussion in this venue. I think we could just add a second API. We have that internally in node where we have uh, import wrapped and it gives us extra stuff that we need for our loader. Um, dynamic import itself is not sufficient for a variety of things in our loader. Okay, so, so Bradley, does that mean that you're agreed that import itself should be the unboxed one? I am fine with that as long as we do introduce something with a boxed form. Let's talk about what that boxed form would include. Um, what, what kinds of things does nodes loader depend upon receiving from uh, so, wrapped import? Historically, uh, we were using the return value actually from modules. And we were using the namespace. Those were our two major data. Uh, due to top level of weight, we can't reliably use the return value of modules, which is complicated. Because if you have a top level of weight, you always get undefined, not what you might expect as a completion value. Um, I was, so we moved. I was not aware that modules had a completion value as distinct from the uh, namespace object. They do, and Node could not have shipped ES modules uh, without it for oh. a long time. <laughs> we, we, we eventually got a workaround, but we had to go with V8 for a couple times. Uh, they were used as a means to create source text module records that wrapped other module types. Um, so yeah, uh, so those were the two main datum um, that we were trying to get out of it. Uh, the other thing is we needed to know that the module namespace of what we were attempting to import uh, was not an unexpected value. Venables don't guarantee that you will even get a export back. So. Uh, the proposed has the wrong return type. Uh, it's promise any. Um, <laughs> so uh, mm. you, we really use promise wrapped still to ensure we have the right uh, module object. Um, that is the main reason we have it today. Um, I, I see what you mean. The, the proxied exports type is not guaranteed because if it's a thenable, it, it could be changed to something else. It's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed to ever complete. Um, so you can't really test things where you want to uh, work on it without uh, needing it to run to completion, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fine just because developers really do need convenience APIs uh, to have it act like dynamic import, but uh, just having written a loader, uh, you do need the ability to get a specifier and say, I want that exact specifier's uh, module exports. Ah, we have a method for that. Um, assuming that we have consensus on adding uh, compartment.module, 
we have that. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm I'm pretty fine with that, but still that API would probably need to be boxed because there are other potential things that we could have. We uh, currently uh, use closures to deal with import meta, uh, and I'm unclear exactly how we would do that. Oh, I think I think import meta should be a, a hook. I think that's actually missing from our list of hooks there. Um, oh yes. So it is. import meta is very interesting and very uh, chaotic in engine implementations uh, because import meta only gets reified the first time it is evaluated. Yep, it's not eager. Uh, I think that's fine. Um, but that's only but it's only, still, still only evaluated at most once. Uh, I don't think that's guaranteed, but yes. Okay, I propose to guarantee I propose we should guarantee it. Okay, uh, I'm neutral on that. I, I think currently you are allowed if it fully GCs to uh, then that, that makes that would make GC observable. Um, we want to be very, very we want to be very, very careful where we introduce GC observability. We've introduced that with read references, but we've been very careful to quarantine it. Yes. So import meta right now. Um, I don't know if there was ever any cross check against weak refs. There, the I don't see any reason why. Um, import meta needs to be able to go away on GC after it's been observed. Um, well, uh, the, is still around. if the module itself as a whole gets garbage collected, then fine. But if the module itself is not garbage collected and it's possible. Also, import meta is a special form. So you can tell lexically whether or not it's possible, the engine can tell whether it's possible for that expression to be evaluated again. Once it's not possible that the expression gets evaluated again, that's, gr that's grounds for garbage collecting. But until then, it's just not garbage. It should not be. I think we should take a strong stance on that. Uh, I, I need to check. Generally, generally, the engines have been shy about introducing GC non-determinism once it's pointed out. It might just be that they weren't aware that they introduced a, a observable GC behavior there. Yeah. I. Uh, import meta, uh, perform, do, do, do. finalize, do, do, do. Uh, it is kept now on an internal field on the module. Okay. And internal fields retain unless specified otherwise. Correct. So we're fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, even even if we introduce something else, uh, the problem really comes down to you want a boxed form. Um, yeah, so either I can see there one there needing to be either a boxed form, um, or just a whole bunch of parallel methods for getting individual individual fields per module. Um, uh, I, either option leads lends us the extensibility we're looking for. Yeah, which is fine, and I don't think this is an immediate thing that I'm looking to. Cool, cool. Oh. All right, then. Um, I will propose. I will propose text to this effect, uh, since I don't. I don't feel that there are any strong objections, um, and uh, and I, I have also pending. Um, consensus with modable folk. Well, uh, we can just send, we can send them the recording and then, or repeat these conversations. Yeah, there's a, the, this, the, the options bag thing uh, with the compartment constructor still just named compartment. Uh, that presents a big transition compat problem. It does. Their current system will simply recognize the options bag as endowments and treat all the bindings as endowments to be added to the global. Yes. So I don't know how they would cope with that if we yeah. don't. There's, there certainly is an API log jam. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure how we make progress on that, uh, okay. apart from making a, a major breaking release and 
just is leaving a whole lot of code behind. Well, the, I mean, the, just the other principle um, that we've generally followed applied consistently here, um, I can't say I like this, would be that we, we rename the constructor in question something other than compartment. Yeah. Because compartment itself and their implementation is already associated with an incompatible API and there's no way to feature detect which call is happening. Yeah, um, that might be necessary. Um, I'm not jazzed about renaming compartment, but uh, we could if we had to. Yep. All right. Um, the last topic is weedy and and not well formed, um, but I bring it up because it's an issue that is on the horizon for us at Agoric, um, and that is that compartments are very compartment constructors are very interesting and special. Um, in a sense that they are meta constructors, um, and uh, or or at least they they have where well, the implementation needs to be able to construct new constructors for every compartment. So if you instantiate new compartment within that compartment, there will be a global this dot compartment constructor that is different than the parent. Um, uh, that being the case. Uh, it may become necessary, uh, it, well, it almost, it is certainly necessary for Agoric use cases that we expose from our shim uh, some vehicle for constructing compartments uh, as, as uh, compartment constructors, uh, as a meta constructor. Um, there is no precedent for a meta constructor in the language. Um, so uh, this is this is interesting. <laughs> uh, well, the, the function constructor might be considered one. Um, in what any case, a question. Go. Uh, since the constructor, since the compartment constructor, as you say, is already a meta constructor and that it constructs new compartment constructors, uh, anything that you uh, can do with this uh, new level, couldn't you do by adding a hook to the options bag and just still just having a compartment constructor where the hook has to do with conditioning what kind of compartment constructors that compartment creates? Uh, possibly. That's worth investigating. OK. Uh, the, the, trick, the, the trick with the compartment constructors is that if you create a compartment constructor decorator, um, or I hesitate to say the word decorator, an adapter, uh, I mean is in the design pattern, not the language feature. Um, the, um, that needs to be enforced transitively. Uh, so not just your child can compartments, but your grandchild compartments need to be, um, subject to the code introduced, um, uh, to, uh, to alter the compartment constructor itself. In any case, um, the, the purpose of this feature for Agoric's case is that we have the need to um, adapt our compartment constructors such that they have certain inescapable transforms and inescapable intrinsics. Uh, that is to say that if you create a compartment with a metering transform that ensures that your code is metered and, uh, and, and, and a global lexical that is the meter, um, that needs to be realized for any of your transitive compartments, even if uh, even if a, 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 a compartment um, creates a child compartment, and that child compartment creates another compartment. Um, and uh, for this to work, we had to be able to make a compartment constructor that we could use as a tool um, to essentially implement the node behavior, uh, the, the, the node compartment graph builder. Um, now, I won't get too much into this because I don't think that there's a lot of need for feedback. We're still in the midst of um, we're still in the midst of of, uh, of settling on this API, and we have not uh, we have not exposed it as public yet in the SES shim. Uh, though we will need to come up with something soon. Um, Let me make two quick points about this. Mm -hmm. uh, one is metering case is unusual because in general we don't have a need for this because the default is that a compartment 
creates a powerless environment unless endowed. Um, and therefore, the need to transitively reduce power doesn't usually arise because it's already starting off powerless. Uh, metering uh, uh, reveals that uh, what we mean by powerless in general does not include uh, limiting compute resources. So that's a additional uh, reduction in power that we don't normally talk about. Uh, the other thing I wanna mention is that uh, realms have uh, so far avoided um, uh, talking about host hooks at the realm level because of the assumption that, or not the assumption, the negotiated compromise that compartments would also create a new realm constructor. And that's a compromise I want to revisit. I don't think that's the right way to do that. Um, so, I, but, um, so I just want to put that on the table. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm just going to uh, race to the end here, since there's not a lot to discuss, um, and uh, that's half baked at best. Um, and since and that's well timed, since we only have the five minutes remaining, um, let's uh, briefly re go over uh, the announcement we made before we began recording, uh, since Sala had follow up question. Um, that was that. Uh, uh, regard so, so uh, Ses Shim um, just landed. Um, just we just released a, a version of the Ses Shim that has um, that, that allows us to uh, transport the error stack uh, to the console without revealing it to anybody who catches the error. Um, and uh, Sala had a follow up question, I believe, about how we go about that and. Uh, uh, or, or details about what we ended up implementing. Yeah, I think um, uh, just to try to reiterate it, um, sometimes you want to actually explore the stack of an error that you get in your code. Um, um, so I, I just wanted to know like how that would be affected, um, especially because the stacks that you get from different uh, runtimes uh, historically had been different. Um, so the so this is actually what we're doing is very much along the lines of, but currently a subset of uh, the error stack proposal, um, uh, where uh, there is a uh, some powers that are part of the um, uh, post lockdown that are there are powers that are added to the start compartment globals. Um, but not added to the default globals of new compartments uh, called get stack and get stack string to take an error object as an argument. Um, so if you have those, you still have the power to inspect the stack. And in fact, get stack as opposed to get stack string gives you something much more inspectable because it's a JSON structure with the parts explicitly rather than a big string that you have to scrape. The stack string cannot be scraped accurately because, for example, a function, a, a, a property name or a function name um, associate, um, can have things like parens in it. And once you have function names with parens in it, uh, there's just no way you're going to scrape the stack string accurately. So the, the JSON structure is really essential to programmatic use of the stack. Uh, and the key thing is we make it a special power so that unprivileged programs don't have the power to violate the confidentiality of the of the the call stack that they that they find themselves in. Okay, that that sounds good. Um, just a follow up uh, tangent. Uh, there's also a source mapping URL, I think, which allows you to shadow in some you know uh, some uh, code that works and other code that doesn't. And I think it's because. Um, um, you know, the implementation was not standardized. Um, so ha has source mapping URLs um, been, um, I guess, factored into the design or? Uh, they have not, I've thought about it. Uh, I would like to factor them into design. The answer is no, they have not been. Uh, as far as I know right now, um, the source maps affect the stacks seen through IDE debuggers, but they do not affect the stacks seen through 
error.stack. Uh, right. And I have no idea if they see the stack as printed by current consoles. But, but the fact that, they, that the source maps do not affect the, the stacks as seen by error.stack is, 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 is weird and um, something I would like to, to uh, repair as we go forward with the error stack proposal. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that's, I guess that's all. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for bearing with me for my very long presentation. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and see you all in the GitHub issues. Um, it, let's see, I'm going to stop recording. Does anybody wish to discussing before anything before I stop recording? <laughs> All right, thank you.